Hello, welcome to Contributions with me, Andrew Masawi. My guest this week was my old friend, Daryl Upsall. Daryl has been in the nonprofit sector for over 35 years and started out straight after university in the UK, went on to run fundraising for the Terence Higgins Trust, then on to lead fundraising internationally for Greenpeace, where he pioneered face-to-face -face fundraising. Since then, he went on, uh, started his own company, Daryl Upsall Consulting, based in Madrid, but really serving organizations around the world. I think he's worked with hundreds and hundreds of organizations in over probably 60, 70, 80 countries uh, over that 35 years. So he's been in the sector a lot longer than I have. We had a fantastic conversation. We talked about what he's seen, the changes that he's seen in that time about his hopes and visions and for the future of the sector, as well as the impact of, of COVID and, and how that may fundamentally change the way that nonprofits uh, operate. So I had a blast catching up with my old friend, Daryl, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Daryl, it's great to see you. You too, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well, I'm doing well. And so, the the age obviously you still do recruitment internationally and i know that you know I, I see your posts on linkedin you you recruit for some of the largest international ngos but you also have really pioneered the um the use of face-to-face -face fundraising um also tele fundraising you do a lot of that as well and so you know we we've seen face-to-face -face fundraising i've seen it go from non-existent to you know, to to um, it being very prevalent in the major cities. So, and I think you've got you are in many ways to thank for the for the for for that mechanism and success of fundraising. So, how do you see the involvement of that, and how do you see how do you see COVID affecting that? I'm interested to know yeah. what you've seen. It's there. an interesting thought. Face to face. I mean, my own personal my own personality is always as a kid. I said nothing is impossible and everything only to excess. And those two mottos have their strengths and the weaknesses, certainly the latter. Um, but it just meant I've always, if somebody said it couldn't be done, I would do it right. uh, individually and, and professionally. And so when the first whisperings of telephone fundraising came into the UK via the IFC conference in Holland, I said, I'm going to go with it and helped co-found the first telephone fundraising agency and was the first client of the first agencies in the UK, one from the USA, Fact Fox, the other Pell and Bales, and wow. absolutely argued the case for it against my peers in, in, the, in the sector who thought, no, this is too American. And guess what? It worked. And the next thing was at Greenpeace, we we're doing two things that was way ahead of time. Face-to-face -face fundraising we invented in Austria 20 years ago plus, uh, 25 years ago, in fact, we were due to have celebrated it with a big conference uh, from people around the world in the home city, Vienna, face-to-face -face last year. COVID put pay to that, but we'll get onto that later. And that has now since become the biggest, sing biggest single fundraising tool in the world. And we have the data from the 20 or so largest nonprofits, biggest single recruiter of monthly donors. And I'm sure it impacts upon your work uh, in your company because you know, it's generating a massive number of auto payments. And the other was, and I was chatting with a colleague only yesterday about a conference we're going to put together on digital. In 93, Greenpeace was raising $50,000 a month online uh, for the organization. I spoke in the UK at a conference in 1994, and no single fundraising director had an email, knew what WWW stood for, had, or had ever visited anything called Interweb. <laughs> and, you know, guess what? COVID has survived not because of face to face that's been hard hard hit but digital has boomed mm. on tv something else i was involved with quite early in europe and failed i have to say not everything works i failed for greenpeace across 20 markets with the same advert pre-euro a disaster um but digital's absolutely skyrocketed during mm. and social during um covid so I don't know, always always trying to be on the edge and always trying to bring something new to clients. And that's often what people ask us for as well. Yeah, yeah. It's To your point, it's interesting because 
who we obviously saw last year as one of the largest payment processes and solution providers to charities. We saw obviously digital. It was a massive increase in the adoption of, of digital and digital fundraising in general. But what was also interesting is when you looked in, you know, Canada has, Canada versus the US, Canada has quite a high um, adoption rate of monthly and recurring giving program. Whereas, yeah. you know, it's really, I wouldn't say it's mature in, in the US like it is in the in Europe, you know, where it is massively prevalent as, I mean, would you say it's the, probably the, the predominant fundraising mechanism in certainly in the UK or in Europe? No, in, in the entire world, monthly giving automatic payment through direct debit or credit card in some countries is the biggest single gross earning source and in fact single biggest net earning because of course once these payments are established yeah they go on and on and that's why sometimes canada a market i know very well including in vancouver where you are but also the wonderful afp conference that takes place normally every year in toronto yeah they i would say canadian fundraisers for example have taken on the best of the us so wonderful at major gift high net worth leadership giving but actually have taken the European model, which started through Greenpeace, I have to say, of converting donors into monthly payers through the bank credit card. The US is still nowhere near. Yeah, I, I, I was speaking to this many, many years ago. We were talking about the donor pyramid and we were talking about um, the uh, the effects of month of monthly donors and and whether or not you know if, if it's part of the monthly of the of the donor pyramid and what they said was I found fascinating is they said well it, it, their contention was is that it's not necessarily an entry point to the donor pyramid it's unlikely that somebody coming and giving a, a you know a, a recurring gift of five dollars five pounds two pounds is going to become a major donor however because of the loyalty that they're showing, they're much more likely to become a, a legacy donor, as an example, and Lisa, would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely, and, and that nonsense of the donor pyramid saying single donors become the major donors and the monthly donors don't. In fact, one of the, the interesting trends when I first came to Spain is I had uh, child sponsorship charities, the largest ones as our clients, and still are, and they were going, we don't have major donors. And I said, well, let's look at your database. And there were some women sponsoring 30 children at the equivalent of, you know, 20 US dollars per month per child. They were giving thousands per month, but were sliding under the radar because mm -hmm. they were multiple. The, the, the other thing that is rarely calculated or certainly not enough calculated is donor lifetime value because you know, somebody giving for 20 years and, and an ever increasing monthly amount has given hundreds of thousands by the end of their lifetime. And then, like you say, likely to leave a legacy. Wow. So uh, going back, I'm, I'm interested uh, about what you think in terms of the short term impact. I think that's obviously very interesting. I think a lot of people are interested in that from a global perspective. But also, is do you think it's fundamentally do you think it's going to change the, the way that uh, nonprofits operate in terms of how they fundraise? So it's the same question, but in two different, asked in two different yeah. ways. I, I think in the, in the 12 months since we've had since lockdown, which is kind of in most countries roundabout now, there have been a lot of fundamental changes and there has been a, a massive difference between the winners and losers. Most of our clients, the large international UN agencies, nonprofits with massive fundraising programs across 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, 90, 100 countries have done extremely well. Why? Because they switched their investment from their biggest uh, donor acquisition and income generator being face to face. They flipped that money straight into digital to direct response TV. They even flipped the teams as we did, people who are on the street normally asking for money uh, and having conversations with donor donors. What are they going to do at home? Well, they talk to people. So they put them into their call centers. They set mm -hmm. them up. At, you know, we had 200 callers from one Friday being in a call center to being live Monday morning uh, in a whole different environment calling from home. Face to faces went into uh, calling from home, calling existing donors, calling out to their, their networks through social media, 
and we're hugely successful at it. And we have seen clients growing 20, 30% that invested. And on the other side, I've seen organizations that I think will collapse. I believe 25% of all nonprofits in most mature markets will disappear in the next 12 months. Why? Because their leadership and board told them not to upset their donors by asking for money during COVID. Utterly stupid decision on their behalf. Do you think, um, when you say that they're not going to, do you think that they're going to consolidate? Because we've all, you know, in Canada, actually in, in generally in North America, there's a lot of consolidation happening with some of these lives. Do you think that's going to happen? Or do you think that physically they're just not going to, they're just going to stop um, fundraising? It's, it's quite funny. For, for many years, for at least three decades, I've usually said survival of the fittest and the mega NGOs will become mega, more mega. Globalization will be the biggest trend. And I've argued, argued that mergers and takeovers would be the future. There is a massive upsurge in mergers, but let's be frank, it's like many mergers. It's actually a bigger partner who's got resources taking over smaller ones who may have databases, may have program work, um, but fail to survive these, these difficult times. So yes, there's going to be consolidation um for sure where there were 20 cancer charities there might become five where there are you know 10 local food banks you know which are in huge demand right now mm. financially they'll struggle and they'll probably narrow down to one or two etc cetera, etc cetera. and that happened by the way in the last at the end of the last pandemic mm. uh, hiv aids organizations boomed around the world providing care support counseling before there was a well, not vaccine, but those antiretroviral drugs, the minute they came out, there was no need for most HIV AIDS organizations. And mm. they either closed or merged into the Terence Higgins Trust. Mm. And one of my funniest experiences or strangest experiences was when Freddie Mercury died and we re-released with Queen Bohemian Rhapsody to raise money for the Terence Higgins Trust, put on a huge global conference at Wembley. Um, I had to sit with my heroes of Queen around a table in our crappy offices and go, no, we don't need another hospital wing called the Freddie Mercury Memorial Hospital Wing. There will be no hospital wings. And as we've seen, there are no hospital wings for people with AIDS in most countries. Now those hospitals are filled with COVID. Mm. So uh, switching gears, in that 35, 37 years that you've been, sorry to, rem sorry to remind you. When they used to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what's interesting is that from a technology standpoint, you have seen, you know, you've seen things change and the landscape of the technology that is available to support charities to do this fundraising. It is, it has evolved to an extent. I mean, you talk about, you know the recurring giving among you know the the ability now for organizations to be supported by very complex infrastructure to manage you know we we have some customers that do two three four hundred thousand donations in a in a month um you know that that didn't really exist 20 yeah. years ago 30 years. so interested in what you see there good and bad in terms of the technology and how that has supported the the um, the aspirations of the sector. Interesting question, Andrew. You know, I remember the excitement of when we got our first fax machine. Because can you can you imagine it was all teletext before? Yeah, <laughs> Everything had to be sent by couriers. We had bike couriers, motor couriers, even in the tiny little campaigning organizations. The fax machines were a revolution. Photocopiers changed our lives. We didn't have inky <laughs> hands from. These things that used to roll and splurt ink everywhere to make your leaflets. Oh no, I don't. I don't remember that. <laughs> no, no, you're far too young. <laughs> but uh, no, those were big changes because actual fact, you know, even mailing letters out was not really fully industrialized in the UK till late seventies, I'd argue, and it was still pretty manual activity, unlike the US where it had blown up earlier. Um, so you have these kind of archaic technologies, and then we started to get databases, which by the way, uh, were all financial service databases. This is mm -hmm. yeah, pre-Blackboard, pre, which you all know, we're not, know well of. Um, you know, you had a database and it will be 
from your accountancy company and yeah, pre Salesforce, all of that. So we knew little about our donors other than their name and address. And if they had one change of a letter, it was another donor. And now we're doing, you know, data mining, we're doing artificial intelligence, we're doing all kinds of profiling activities. You know, I run a, own, don't run, uh, co-own a digital agency uh, in Spain and Italy. And the, the journey, I wouldn't even say donor journey, the communication journey that goes on through Facebook is tailored to the profile of the individual. It's not one size fits all. And that mm -hmm. allows us to then make an ask that is actually an ask they've already more or less said yes to. I mean, technology is taking us a long way. The downside, because you did say downsides, mm -hmm. is a lot of fundraisers hide behind computers. Many fundraisers have never met a donor. They've never actually asked anybody to give. They haven't necessarily given themselves, which I find disgusting, but that <laughs> happens. And then suddenly we have storytellers. So, so we're kind of, I will see fundraising in cycles and great fundraising in direct mail was great storytelling. It's great writing. The George Smiths, the, um, you know, the heroes of the previous, Roger Craver, you know, still going mm -hmm. strong at his uh, ripe age of seven, late 70s. Um, and now suddenly people are having to write really good copy because you've got to write good copy for social media. You've got to write sharp copy, emotional copy, and tell great stories. So some of the good stuff comes back, and it's the good stuff from the past. Mm. Yeah, the the story about never, you know, not asking and uh, in the fundraisers not asking. I remember being at a conference in the UK, and it was when um, it was a, a higher education conference. And of course, the, the, the culture of giving in higher education in the US is, is rich and long and well documented and not so much in the UK. And, and when I was talking to somebody uh, sort of who actually was leading the uh, internal transformation for Oxford University, and they were saying, well, it's very simple. The reason we don't have a culture of giving in higher education, a culture of giving is that we don't have a culture of asking which I thought was an yeah. interesting way and very true and sort of kind of affirms what you've said. And Oxford was the pioneer of modern uh, major gift fundraising, alumni fundraising. I remember I happened to be by coincidence when the first American leader of Oxford's fundraising set up his office in Oxford. And I was there when he unpacked the boxes and I was like, oh, what are they? He said, they're computers with all kinds of things we could do with them. Um, but the biggest challenge for Oxford and Cambridge, where I went, was actual fact, academic. God forbid, should I ask for money? Hell no. Oh, heavens on earth. You know, if you're if you're at Stanford, Harvard, it's written into your contract. You are fundraising. You know, you right. have to go out there and ask. Yeah. Do you have optimism for the sector? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and. It's, it's interesting, the sector. The sector's morphing a lot, in my view. You know, I was in an interesting debate the other day um, whether the word charity is even applicable and in which cultures it's applicable. It has, you know, a certain smell of, you know, the patronizing white northern giving the poor of the Africa or whatever arms. And now I think we're raising money for social change we're empowering the beneficiaries so interesting a lot of our work even the development ngos is seeing if even the democratic republic of congo can help raise funds for its own needs um, on certain issues and the other thing is there's a massive move to the south so you know i've seen the most exciting fundraising developments in the last 20 years in thailand in mm -hmm. south korea which is perhaps not such a new market. Many people don't recall that actually World Vision, one of the biggest nonprofits in the world, a multi-billion dollar organization, was founded in South Korea. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. And 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 when I, I was invited by the South Korean government to uh, help them develop a strategy with others on, on how to be the most best prepared philanthropic and fundraising nation on the planet, uh, at the opening and closing of the national of the event at the National Library each day, they showed videos of how World Vision had helped transform one of the poorest countries in the world as a donor beneficiary of, of aid 
to a donor grantor of support to other countries. And not just, you know, it wasn't just World Vision. Other big nonprofits came out of those markets. Mm. Plan International, a great uh, development organization as well, yeah. founded in Spain during the Civil War. You know, it was very few Paris, people. But... Yes. <laughs> and then thrown out by Franco for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and now China has, has, is my next big excitement, I think. Yeah, and I know you've written some uh, really interesting papers on that, and I'm actually going to I'll post those links as well when when we publish this talk because I think that and I just generally some links to those articles because there's some of them I was going through them recently and they're just they're just fascinating perspective, and I I mean I have to say I couldn't agree more I think that you know I have been not nearly I haven't been in, in the sector for nearly as long as you and haven't had nearly the impact that you've had but even I. Have noticed in my short time this the sheer resilience of the nonprofit sector everything that gets thrown at the sector they just the resilience in an it, it, given that they are generally it's under resourced it's overworked um yeah. is just fascinating you know we saw in december the biggest december in terms of processing of of donations that we've ever that we've ever had certainly in in as long as we've been keeping records which tells us after covid what a what a what an inspirational um group of individuals that we that i certainly have the pleasure to work with every single day um it's it's forever forever uh, inspirational and surprising i agree and it is resilient but i would say it's under attack as well um Funny enough, we're about to publish an article about how the German, French, and British government are all attacking the not-for-profit social benefit charitable sectors by bringing in legislation that will make it harder to operate, largely because they don't want non-profits criticizing any of the things that they do, hmm. which governments don't get right all the time. You may be surprised to hear. Uh, in, in India, yeah, organizations like Medicine Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Border, Greenpeace, Amnesty have all pretty much been closed down by the, uh, the government there um, because they either show up the state or threaten state interests, allegedly. And China, which is a thriving, growing philanthropic nation, is not exactly welcoming organizations that might test the government on human rights. Uh, Funnily enough, that. China's a bit of a contradiction on that. It actually quite likes being tested on its environmental standards <laughs> and has done for many years. But, and I think that's one threat. And the other threat is actually the sector's complacency sometimes is a threat to itself. So we've seen the sexual abuse scandals in the development on profits. There is bullying, there is abuse, there is um, sexual harassment and the sector I would say worldwide, and it's something I've tracked and been speaking on of, of very recently, has not done a great job at keeping its own house in order. So mm -hmm. yeah, we do great work, we're inspirational, fundraisers raise money, but the organizations still have a way to go to be the angels that they purport to be and not the, maybe, you know, not, not quite as, as good as they should be. Well, isn't that isn't that just the case across so many sectors now? Yeah. The, the, and I think that's the positive thing there is that it, it, the visibility and the need to change and to be sort of uh, inwardly analytical is 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 more prevalent and relevant now more than ever. Yeah. Um, so, so and we get and we get prompted. You know, I think I think you know if we look at climate change, we've been prompted by a generation way younger than you or me. Uh, to, to stop the non-profits even being perhaps as complacent and slow in taking action. Black Lives Matter has raised many issues that we have not addressed as a sector, either internally or properly addressed externally. Mm. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm excited, I'm optimistic. There are many mountains to climb. We have not crossed that mountain. We still have Dr. King's words echoing in our ears that we have many more mountains to climb before yes. we hit clear land. Well, progress, not perfection. Yeah, exactly, that's true. So we're gonna finish off. We're gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask now the same six questions, the quick six to every single one of my guests. So <laughs> rapid fire, here we go. Favorite app on your iPhone or on what, your phone? WhatsApp, 
No what question. Type, your least favorite app on your phone? Uh, oh, you know, I'm struggling with this one. I put TikTok on the other day, but I couldn't even figure it. But it's got to be Twitter because it seems to cause more problems than, than benefit. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, uh, what song or movie captures Daryl Upsall? I'm going to give you two, and they are interconnected. As a kid, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong lifted me, inspired me. And if I hear it now with his Louis Armstrong, I stand corrected. Uh, it brings joy and hope to me every day, and I sing along. And the one that follows that is What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, recorded in 1971, highlighting all the social, racial, political problems of the day. And boy, you can listen to every word of that song and still be angry, but inspired to make a difference. Fantastic choices. Love them. Um, what is the first nonprofit organization that you remember as a child? The Sea Cubs and the Sea Scouts. I was a member of both. Passionate. It taught me kayaking and sailing. And even only last night, I was kayaking in the canyons. It taught me camping. It taught me how to cook for large numbers of people. And my middle name is Baden. Oh, Name my goodness. Founder, Baden Powell. Oh and I've goodness. had the honor of working for the Boy Scouts and Boy Guides, uh, Girl Guides movement, training them in fundraising since. Well, um, I can, before I go to the next one, I can attest to anyone that gets an invitation to be cooked uh, for, by, by Daryl is to, wherever you are, accept the invitation because it is a treat, uh, no doubt. So, okay, what nonprofit trend are you watching carefully right now? I think we've pretty much covered that, and that is China, and I've had the honor of working there. But I think the trend that I'm finding fascinating is how does a nation of so big, so digital, move from digital to offline fundraising? Hmm. It doesn't know how to do that yet. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay. What what profession other than your own would you, uh, would you have done? Would you like to attempt? I think you've given the game away, actually. Oh. Uh, I would love to go into the catering industry to, to be a chef or play a role in that industry. My son trained as a Michelin star chef. And now, as a 60-year-old man, I would like to follow in the footsteps of my young son. Oh, how, how lovely. What a, what, and a lovely way to put it as well. Um, and out of interest, I'm also interested, if you could, because you uh, you've, uh, you've traveled around the world, you've lived in Spain for many, many years. If you could live anywhere else, where would you live? Spain. <laughs> oh wow okay that was it <laughs> well yeah. but if it was food that might be a different question uh I, I i think uh when it comes to it italy and its different regional food takes some real beating um but i'd still live in spain the combination of the culture the historical culture the great food the climate and i must admit pretty good wine although you know italy might have an edge in some places <laughs> Daryl, thank you for taking the time. It's just fantastic to see you. It's great to catch up. Really appreciate it. Hopefully there comes a time when we can um, enjoy some great food in some in some part of the world together. So I sincerely hope so. Thank you, Andrew, for the, the opportunity to talk with you today. Speak soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Oh,